Episode 99, former top FBI hostage negotiator and CEO of the Black Swan Group, Chris Voss. Welcome to The Art of Excellence, a show about people doing extraordinary things in their lives. I'm your host, Glenn Zweig. Thanks for joining me. My guest today is Chris Voss. Chris is one of the preeminent practitioners and professors of negotiating skills in the world. He was formerly the lead international kidnapping negotiator for the FBI, as well as the FBI's hostage negotiation representative for the National Security Council's Hostage Working Group. He is the founder and CEO of the Black Swan Group, a consulting firm that provides training and advises Fortune 500 companies through complex negotiations. He has taught business negotiation and MBA programs at the University of Southern California's Marshall School of Business and Georgetown's McDonough School of Business. He has also taught business negotiation at Harvard and guest lectured at other leading universities, including the MIT Sloan School of Management and Northwestern's Kellogg School of Management. His book is titled, Never Split the Difference, Negotiating as if Your Life Depended on It. Chris, welcome to the show. Hey, man, I am happy to be here. Thank you for having me on. Yeah, happy to have you on. So uh, only because this is, you know, sort of fresh in my mind, I don't know if you've been following any of this, uh, this writer strike going on, you know, the WGA in Hollywood, any of that, are you sort of paying attention on the sidelines? Uh, well, you know, I keep hearing about it. I mean, I get, I get friends and acquaintances in the entertainment industry. It seems to me like um, everyone is talking behind the scenes about the fact that they're trying to take the summer off. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I think the summer's almost over, so I think they've uh, they've taken the summer off. But uh, I mean, you know, I'm not going to try to overly simplify a complex problem. But you know, you got the writers that want more uh, income out of this, more residual income. You've got studios that now make a lot of their money off subscription revenue. Uh, so it's a different model than it used to be. Two sides that uh, for months and months haven't been able to come together. So was just sort of curious, even just from an outside observer being the master negotiator, if they brought you in for a day, if you could wave your magic wand, are you seeing anything that gives you some clues as to why these talks can't seem to go anywhere, why they keep breaking down? Uh, because I think they've taken a traditional labor union, labor management approach, which is make a lot of noise, set a deadline so that you can make a lot of noise for a long time. And then get down to business um, to make start making concessions at the last minute, which is nobody's really talking with anybody. You know, intermediaries get paid to keep things going. They don't get paid to resolve things. Hmm. Like lawyer, your lawyer doesn't get paid to resolve a problem for you. Your lawyer gets paid to run up the bill. Um, and then sometimes people then just acquiesce. Uh, a long time ago, I remember having a... Um, Somebody wanted to bring me in to, to give negotiation advice to a, a union negotiator. And of course, the union, the last person he wanted was to, for anybody to give him advice on negotiation. And so we had a side conversation. He said, look, this is just about putting on a show. And I thought, oh, so you're not actually trying to collaborate with anybody. You get paid to put on a show. Now, that doesn't mean that both sides don't have legitimate point, but they start hiring people who get paid to put on a show, get paid to run up a bill, whose compensation is not determined by the effectiveness of the outcome. So anytime you have people whose compensation is not determined by being the effectiveness of the answer, you got misaligned incentives. Interesting. There was something else that it got me thinking you know, in your book, you mentioned how I mean, there, there, there's a lot of obviously smart people at the studios, there's some brilliant writers, it's not lacking intelligence, but you say that some of the smartest people have trouble being good negotiators, because they think that they don't have anything to discover. That's very true. Yeah. Whereas great negotiators are able to question the very assumptions that everyone else maybe accepts in blind faith. 
so we're more open to possibilities. And, and I was sort of thinking through that. It, is it about being smart or is it about being closed minded? Because I, I know some really brilliant people that are, you know, open minded. Love to hear where that's coming from. Yeah, well, you know, and a lot of this is uh, what tends to correlate, you know, so then, you know, is an idea uh, correlation versus causation. Like, where are you going to bet on, uh, at the at the gambling table in Las Vegas? Mm -hmm. You know, you, you play roulette and, uh, you know, bet one specific number and the chances are that you're not, that number is not going to come up. But if you play it long enough, will it come up eventually? Yeah. So it's a correlation. I, I read in a book, I think it was called that, The Habits of Ineffective Negotiators. Hmm. And it listed in that that they had done a study that people with advanced degrees or higher IQs tended to be poor negotiators for exactly what you just said. You know, they, they want to show off what they know. I got a high IQ. I got an advanced degree. I got a PhD. Now, does having a PhD by definition make you a bad negotiator? No. But where, where are you going to bet your money as to whether or not their uh, PhD is going to be a good listener? Well, you're going to start to look at the tracker. Andrew mm -hmm. Huberman, who I'm a very big fan. Of. The neuroscientist. Yeah, yeah, he's got he's got PhDs. God knows how many he's got. Like that dude listens. You know, so does having a PhD automatically disqualify him? But if I run across a PhD to begin with, regardless of what the PhD is, am I extra leery that they might not listen? Yeah, I've got my guard up higher on a PhD. I'm going to want to test them out, you know. Are they researchers or do they think being a PhD made of Jesus? A lot of people that have PhDs think think getting a PhD made of Jesus. It's true because I think it's true. You know, you, you ain't never going to, a guy like Andrew Huberman, you're never going to hear him say, this is true because I think it's true. It, he's going to say, this this is what scientifically rigorous studies that have been published in peer-reviewed journals say. Hmm. Like, you ain't never going to hear him say, this is true because I think it's true. And he's got enough knowledge that he could probably get away with saying that and it'd probably be all right. So that's, yeah, it, it would tends mm. to correlate. Somebody somebody with a, an advanced degree worked really hard for it. They want to show how smart it made them. Chris, I, I, I'm an executive search consultant, you know, leadership advisor. So I, I place a lot of senior executives. I'm, I'm talking people that have climbed the corporate ladder, you know, top of the game CEOs can struggle with this because they figure, well, I've, I've gotten to the top by doing what I've done. So therefore, I, I know what I know. And they sort of stop being curious. They, they stop yes. asking questions. They, they stop listening. Yes. Yes. And the best ones, they, they never stop. They're, they're always in learning mode, you know, throughout their lives. Rewind the clock for me at, uh, at, at little Chris, any, uh, negotiating acumen when you were growing up? Cause I'm wondering how much of this was innate or, or something that you learned over time, but there, there's no way you'd like say, <laughs> I assume you didn't set your sights. I'm being a future, uh, FBI hostage negotiator. So just curious, you know, how this came to be. I think the only thing that was a precursor to it is I lived very much in a blue, I grew up in a blue collar, figure it out environment. Hmm. My father was very blue collar, very, very, very honest, high, high level of integrity, hard work. Um, don't be afraid to get dirty and figure out how to get the job done. That would have been, you know, he wasn't a tre tremendously great communicator. He was just real direct and real blunt and mm -hmm. not loquacious. And I think, you know, he probably listened to people, but a very much more of a figure it out attitude. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I don't, I don't really believe that anything is innate. I think everything is learned, you know, other than my height, pretty much everything else about me is as a result of nurture. How did I eat? How did I exercise? How did I take care of myself? How did I learn? And I, and I do think I am, I have a skill in negotiation and also negotiation coaching. And those are two separate skills. Mm -hmm. You know, Phil Jackson, one of the greatest NBA coaches of all time, he didn't even start for the New York Knicks. Now he played on a championship team and he was the sixth man. So he was a very good player, but he was, he was at best the sixth best guy on that team. Mm -hmm. So, you know, can you do something well and can you coach it to two different skills? I've studied it really hard. I'm fascinated by it. I love it. I love the dynamics. I love learning about it, the nuances. That type of interest may be innate, but that's it. 
did you ever cross paths with the FBI? I mean, I know completely different area, but I interviewed Jack Garcia on this podcast a while back. Does that name ring about? Did you know Jack? No, at all? I'm afraid not. No. Do you know who that is? No. Oh, you know, he was uh, probably considered the greatest FBI undercover agent. Uh, he sort of broke open the Gambino crime family and, and you know, drug cartels and, and you name it would be playing multiple personas all at once. Uh, so it, it's sort of fascinating to me, these these niche, very important, but, but niche fields. So given that this wasn't percolating when you were growing up, when did this idea of whether it was the FBI first or finding some way to leverage negotiations in a future career, when did this start to come into your sights? Well, I had been a member of the SWAT team. I was on the FBI SWAT team in Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to be on a SWAT team when I was a police officer. I just I just took the F job with the FBI before I got transferred. Uh, so I like crisis response and crisis response is decision making, you know, force. You got you got to make a decision. And, you know, Kennedy said a long time ago, the risks and costs of comfortable inaction effectively cost us far more than bad decisions now. If you're willing to learn. So I like decision making. And so I had I was nursing a knee injury. I'd, I'd had my my knee reconstructed twice. And so I wanted to stay in crisis response. We had hostage negotiators, but I figured I had a shelf life, shelf life as a SWAT guy. So I figured, you know, how hard could it be? I figured you talk to people. I, I can't. How hard? I talk to people every day. How hard could that be? <laughs> and so I just I made the transition and then I found it far more rewarding. Uh, for me personally, than SWAT ever was. I loved it. Well, before you got into the the formal, you know, hostage negotiations path, they said that you had to spend some time uh, working a suicide hotline. Yeah, yeah. Or that was somehow a prerequisite. Uh, maybe they wanted to test you and see if you would do it. But you did it. What What did you learn from that experience? I think it was two things. They were testing my initiative. You know, I'm, I'm, do I take initiative? Do I take instruction? Do I take instruction from the right people? Do I and then do I take initiative as a result of being smart enough to listen to the right people? You know, this quick down and dirty test for whether or not they're, they're the right person. Um, never, never take advice from somebody who hasn't been where you're going, or somebody that you wouldn't trade places with. Uh, and and that's a that's a real critical issue. Um, they may be really smart people and have never been where you're going. And their advice is going to be worthless, no matter how smart they are. Or you wouldn't trade places with them in any way, shape, or form. And so I went to the head of the hostage negotiation team, a crisis negotiation team in New York, and got rejected. And But then I persisted. There's got to be something I could do because I take initiative. I'm very proactive. She said, oh, yeah, there is. Go volunteer on a suicide hotline. So what I really learned from that is how quickly – Actual empathy gets people to change their minds, to make a decision on what they're going to do next, what their next step steps are. My boss, Gary Nessner, in Crisis Negotiation Unit, did this thing called the Behavioral Change Stairway, which is what are the steps to getting somebody to change their behavior. The top step is behavioral change. It's a mirror of the same dynamic on the crisis hotline. Somebody going to kill themselves. How do you get them to change their behavior? Or a crisis hotline is not just suicide, but it's everything. How do you get them to take an, a different step other than the direction they're currently going? Em empathy, tactical empathy, emotional intelligence in astonishingly short periods of time. It's, and that's what I really learned. I mean, like the actual application of empathy, not sympathy, not com not compassion. The actual application of showing someone that they feel heard. How quickly you can get them to change their mind about their course of action. That's what I really learned from that. Yeah, could I just double click on that? Could you share the difference between compassion and, and empathy? Empathy is about the transmission of information. Compassion is the reaction to that transmission. So empathy is, look, you feel really backed into a corner here. You feel like you got nowhere to go. Empathy for the writers in uh, the current strike was, you feel that the future looks dim for you as a writer. AI, everybody's res resorting to AI every way they could possibly can. They're knocking themselves out to replace you. 
if you feel that you're getting backed into a corner and the future does not look bright. So they're trying to replace you. The studios are playing games with the streaming services. They're trying to change up, replace you, change up the compensation, change the structure in a complicated way that nobody really understands. So you're hanging on for dear life right here. That's empathy. I didn't say it. I agreed with any of it. All I did was articulate how you see things. Mm -hmm. Now, compassion might be, so here's what I'm going to do about it. Here's how I'm going to get involved and help. I've heard, I've heard a lot of people talking about compassion or the actions that you might take as a result, a compassionate action to assist. And so those w- would really be the differences. I could be the head of a studio. I could be the, uh, the most highly compensated guy in Hollywood, a uh, studio head, and articulate all that without agreeing to any of it. And what are you going to do as a writer? Well, if I say that, you're going to say, all right, so you actually do understand where I'm coming from. There's a pretty good chance we might be able to fashion an outcome if you understand what kind of pressures I'm under as somebody who's working for you. And if you have any interest at all in guaranteeing your future via guaranteeing my future, that's my next test. Are you trying to destroy me or are you trying to use me as a path to guarantee your future. If I'm involved in your vision of the future, we got something to talk about because now I'm a critical point of your, your DNA. Now, what a union rep's going to want to do is a union rep's going to say, well, like, I, you know, you, Mr. Writer, I not only have to guarantee your job, but I have to guarantee the jobs of future writers. Uh, there's a little bit of sleight of hand going on here hmm. because what you're telling me is like, so you want me to, take a cut in pay or you want me to not work longer so that you can guarantee the theoretical income of someone who might not even be born yet or who isn't even a writer yet or who's going to ultimately compete with me for work. You want me to make concessions and stop working long enough so that you can guarantee the future of this theoretical person that may not even actually exist. That's that's where the shell game gets started. Yeah. Like if people are generally talking to each other, the studios need the writers. And they need top quality writers. And so how can we work together so that the cream rises to the top and that we're do we do we got to guarantee the jobs of somebody who's a lousy writer? Uh, So if you can get people to the conversation where I'm after taking care of talent, real, Mm -hmm. real talent or developing it. Now the writers go like, all right, so maybe, maybe I'm not a very good writer yet, but how can you possibly develop me into a better writer so that I become that much more valuable to you? If the conversation goes in that direction, now you got a collaborative conversation. There's actually some compassion going back and forth, but you can't be compassionate. You can't take compassionate steps if you don't actually understand where the other side's coming from. Well, you had this term called uh, tactical empathy and a whole number of rules, but before we, dive into some of the rules uh, about the art of negotiation. I was just sort of curious, were these best practices that you learned through formal training at the FBI, or is it more like you're, you're learning on the fly through a series of actual negotiations, actual hostage situations, and then you're sort of coming up with a framework, you know, in hindsight. How, how does that work? How much was, was here's the FBI playbook? go figure this out and then apply it versus Chris is just going to sort of find his way. It's, it's probably an upward spiral. It's a combination. Like when I walked in to get the, the hostage negotiation training with the FBI, the guys that were running the program at the time, a couple of years earlier, uh, Gary Nestor and Fred Lansley, they really discovered that it was more crisis intervention than negotiation. So they started studying suicide intervention. And I can remember a woman that they used to, we used to quote, and her name would come up in the slides all the time, Shirley Rupel. I mean, I think Gary in particular, his instincts for it were so much that when he ran across Shirley, he was like, aha, this is filling in the gaps. You know, a hostage negotiation, they originally thought it was bargaining. And then, you know, Gary and the people that he worked with were going like, is something wrong? This doesn't feel like bargaining to me. This feels like something else. You know, how many really substantive demands are there here? 
by the time I got there, they're very much into crisis intervention versus negotiation. Like the whole block of instruction was really built around crisis intervention skills. And I think they learned them principally from Shirley. I remember her, her, her name coming up a lot on the slides. Mm -hmm. So when I got trained, I also remember, I just, I, a year and a half, two years on a, on the hotline. I mean, like, I remember literally saying to myself, wow, I've been doing this for two years. I just didn't have a SWAT team outside. Hmm. So then we got into it and, and I had, I brought a heavy grounding of crisis intervention, the active listening skills, which now are proactive, you know, the black swan method. Like I knew it worked. Like when I, I didn't have to be shown that it worked when I got to the training, almost everybody else there with no background and empathy like I had, had ever seen it work in an astonishing fashion. So then I thought, well, we're going to apply this to everything. And so there was, it was group think. I mean, there were very smart people in a crisis negotiation unit. We'd bounce stuff off each other. And then we'd studied it constantly. We immersed ourselves in. It. And so when I, uh, I changed our proof of life protocol, made a significant change in the proof of life protocol. But before I did, I started bouncing off my colleagues who were really smart guys. And I said, I, I, I think it's this. And I'd, and I'd say, you know, guys, am I smoking something here? Am I high? And they'd be like, no, 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 you're on the right track. And so we had our own sort of, you know, skunk works, if you, to use the, the Google terminology. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, we had our own internal skunk works where we were testing out new ideas. And then, then when we felt among the collective brain trust, that it was worth road testing it, then we'd road test it and see how it worked. But we already had a very good indicator that it was going to improve the system. So it wasn't just me. It was some trial and error, but it's a little more complicated than trial and error. Well, with, with trial and error, it got me thinking, I mean, how do you actually test these methods? Because when, when a hostage situation is happening, I mean, you've, you've got you know people's lives on the line. So are, are there like mock scenarios that's happening during training or is it like, well, there's no other way other than just to apply these things in real life and, and hope that they go the right way. No, we'd, we'd see it demonstrated in a real life scenario and a light bulb would go on and we'd have to see it a couple of places. So what do I mean by that? I'm working a Burnham case in the Philippines and we suddenly are told that one of our hostages has been heard on the fire. And at that, and it ain't a phone that we control. And we thought we were the only game in town. And so at, the, at that point in time, like, I am just like, I'm flummoxed. I'm, I, I, I don't know what to make of this. Number one, what is, who's talking? Who's getting one of our hostages on a phone? And, and how did they get him on a the phone? Like the whole time I'd been working kidnappings, I'd never heard of anybody getting a hostage on a phone. And, I, I go to my boss, Gary, and I go, like, we got an over here. One of our hostages is on the phone. Like, what does that mean? He goes, well, it's two things. Somebody else is bargaining to get him out. And no hostage is ever on the phone unless it's proof of life. And I'm, I remember thinking, like, who in God's name is other than families trying to buy the hostage out? And it, as it turns out, it was, a, it was a corrupt criminal in the Philippines who was trying to embarrass the government. And secondly, how the hell did he get him on the phone? Because we're supposed to be the best in the world, and I can't get somebody on the phone. <laughs> so I, I got this eating at me. The case it just was this ongoing mess of a lack of cooperation inside the Philippine government between Philippines and the Americans. It just turned into a train wreck. But it's still eating at me. How, does, how did somebody get this hostage on the phone? So now I'm listening to a tape recording of a kidnapping of a drug dealer in Pittsburgh, one drug dealer has kidnapped another drug dealer's girlfriend. The victim drug dealer has gone to the FBI. Because who, who do you go to when a family member has been kidnapped? Even if you're a bad guy, you go to the FBI. And our negotiators are riding around with this guy while he's talking to the kidnapper on the phone. And this guy in the midst of the conversation, because they got no proof of life. And he says to the other kidnapper, hey, dog, how do I know she's all right? And there's this long silence on the other end of the phone. And the kidnapper comes back with, instead of a demanding tone of voice, a accommodating tone of voice. And he goes, oh, I'll put her on the phone. And I'm like, that's it. That how question 
which never occurred to me in a million years. It works because it's deferential. It's not demanding. The long silence on the other end of the phone indicated it made the other guy stop and think. And he got presented with a problem and it made him feel empowered to solve it himself. And the 90 degree change in his tone of voice indicated what it did to him in thinking about it. And he, this drug dealer does something that I was never capable of. So hmm. we, you know, I think the, the sequence is I was aware of a question. How do I get a hostage on the phone? And it troubled me from a real life scenario. And then in another real life scenario, I hear the answer and I recognize it instantly and I apply it. So no, we didn't try this in role plays and say, maybe this will work. We saw it work in real life and applied it. Hmm. Yeah, you mentioned these how questions mm -hmm. are really important and, and because you're wanting to empower the other side to feel like they've got control yes. and that changes the dynamic. Really uh, interesting. W when you go into these situations, I know it's been some years removed, but I'm, I'm sure a lot of these are fresh in your mind. How do you stay calm? You're, you're you're walking into a situation you, you don't know if they're going to potentially kill this person or not i mean you you hope they're not you hope they just want the money or whatever they're asking for but you never know for sure you're now the chosen person to figure this out and and come out hopefully with a peaceful resolution that feels pretty stressful just asking you the question sitting here was there a technique you used just to calm yourself down to, to calm your mind to, to go into these things with an uh, you know level head and, and, and work through it? It's a two-step process, one of which that I just realized was true. But I had a process that I was comfortable with successful. And again, to use one of Gary's phrases, best chance of success. I had a process that I really believed in because I had been trying it in real life scenarios on a suicide hotline. And so then when I heard the dynamics in Christ in hostage negotiation, I knew it was the same. And what I now realize is, and there's neuroscience out there that says anytime you relax into stress, you'll handle it far better. The act of relaxation actually increases your body's ability to physically handle the stress demands. Your heart pumps more effectively. It pumps through your circulatory system more effectively. All your bodily systems work at a higher level when you relax. And I now realize that since I had a process that I had faith in based on experience, real experience, that I just relaxed into the process. I now know I got faith in this. I can relax. All I got to do is kick in a process. And so my tone of voice, my ability to listen under stressful situations, the fact that I had faith in a process triggered me to relax. And that, that's what made the difference. So back up one step, how do you allow yourself to relax walking into such a high stakes situation? Well, and then how, how do you get comfortable enough in a process so that you will relax into it really? Mm -hmm. And so I get comfortable enough in a process by first trying to stuff out on, uh, on a crisis hotline, a suicide hotline. Then actually what I did in those crisis hotline days was I thought, I wonder if this stuff works in everyday life. And so I started applying it in my everyday interactions, which meant I had a lot more uh, data bank in my experience, uh, success data bank, like the feel for it, because I've been trying it over and over. Now what we treat in a black swan group is small stakes practice for high stakes results. I mean, if, if you're learning negotiation for me, you are not going to use it the first time when you got your job on a line. You're not going to use it in a job negotiation. You're not going to use it in a car negotiation. You're not going to use it in any negotiation if you haven't practiced. Pretend practice doesn't work. It's only real life practice. Mm -hmm. Well, the point of fact, how you do anything is how you do everything. What does that mean? That means that your practice with your Lyft driver is good practice for a high stakes salary negotiation. Your practice with the Starbucks barista is legitimate, applicable practice to your car negotiation, to your house negotiation, but especially your salary negotiation. If you've got used to using these skills with every Lyft driver you ever ride with, 
Seems like you're having a tough day. Seems like you're in a good mood today. None of that is how are you. Starting out by throwing uh, a read, if you will, on their emotions in a moment and then slapping an observation, a verbal observation, a label on. Seems like you're having a tough day. That's just slapping a read on. I do that with enough Lyft drivers. I get ready to sit down with my boss. I'm going to do the same thing with him. And I'm going to be really effective because I've been practicing in small stakes. So I had faith in a process because I had had time on the suicide hotline in everyday life that my gut told me it worked. So as long as you're on that, let, let's talk about some of the, because that's labeling, I think, that you're talking yeah. about there. So can you maybe define labeling and then there's mirroring and there's some of these you know, neuro behaviors that are, are pretty vital. So the, yeah, they, yeah, on yeah. the surface, they sound easy, but clearly people don't practice them enough. So what, what are they and how do they work? Yeah, well, what's simple, what's simple and difficult? Uh, labels are just a verbal observation of an emotion or a dynamic. It's that simple. It's you sound, you seem, you look. It sounds, it seems, it looks, it feels. I mean, it's re in incredibly simple. Now, the difficulty only comes in if you don't practice. Like shooting a gun is sight alignment and trigger control. And it, it doesn't matter what kind of gun you're shooting. It's all it's that simple. You line up the sights, you pull the trigger slowly, you hit the bullseye every time. But you got to do it over and over and over and over until you finally actually get it. And you can do it every time. Simple and difficult. A label is just slapping a, slapping a verbal observation on an, an emotion or a dynamic. Okay. It seems like you track it. It seems like you listen. Or if I say something and you go look off to the side and then look back, then the appropriate label would be, seems like something just crossed your mind. So it's staying dialed into the moment and verbally observing what's going on and being willing to be wrong. And being willing to be corrected, that's that's what is the biggest sticking point for the vast majority of people learning it. They're scared to get it wrong. Like, what if I get it wrong and it makes them mad or they yell at me? You know, I'm horrified uh, because they're they're afraid of being embarrassed. That, that gets to the key issue of everything about empathy. It's not about you. What's a very embarrassing moment for you can be a very collaborative moment for the other side. Like if you correct me and I don't know any better, I'm embarrassed. But if you correct me, you're helping me. It's highly collaborative. Those are two vastly different experiences in the same moment. Empathy is about me understanding what your experience is and taking away some of the fears of my own. And so what does that have to do with labels? I could label you wrong. And there's a pretty good chance you're either going to get a funny look on your face or co openly correct me. Now, to me, I, you're, just, you're just helping me get it, get it right. But it's taken practice for me to understand the value of being corrected. And Chris, I'm assuming in a lot of these uh, crisis situations, there's no visual reference, right? You're, you're, I assume you're talking on the phone, so you lose all the visual cues. You lose the body language, you use the facial expressions. So you, you've got to, I, I, I assume, so you've got to be that much better at, at really listening to what's being said to be able to do that. Is that fair? Yeah. And if that's your starting point, it actually gets really easy for you. Like I think the one big advantage that hostage negotiators have in listening skills is we're all trained from the beginning. It's going to be over the phone. So we never feel a loss in our training of not having visual cues. And consequently, all the information I need is going to be in a voice. So that's, a, that's enough for me. Like uh, On occasion, when you're going dead silent, if it's just voice to voice, I don't know for sure what's going on. Now, through context and 20 minutes into the conversation, well, the third conversation in, I'm going to have a real good gut feel for when you're going silent. But like my son, Brandon, who's a brilliant negotiator, he can go dead silent for long periods of time. Either he's thinking or he's mad. And so what I'll say to him is like, look, I can't tell if you're thinking or if you're mad right now. And he'll go, no, 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 I'm thinking. Or go, no, as a matter of fact, I am angry. So I'm just checking in. 
because I can't read the silence in a moment. I got no tonality to read. I know I got this long gap. It's one of two things. Let me find out. Th this is your son? Yeah. Uh, Apple doesn't fall far, does it? <laughs> no, he's... He, as it turns out, he's a better negotiator than I. I it's, uh, it's hard to believe, but uh, what, how about mirroring? Let's let's talk about that one. Yeah, mirroring is uh, it's not the body language mirror; it's just re the repetition of the last three words of what somebody said. If you want to learn a skill, the first question you're going to ask is: Does it have to be three words? And it's three-ish, one to five, never more than five. Mm -hmm. And does it have to be the last three words? No, it doesn't have to be the last three words. And I can any any time that I want to stop and say, what did you mean by that? Instead of doing that, the smart move on my part is just to pick the, what what the, that was and repeat it word for word of what you just said. And you'll expand and you will go on. And, and once again, point being that they'll feel heard, they'll feel listened to. Well, and that particular the advantage of mirroring is not only they heard, but you've communicated that you didn't quite get it and you need different words. It, it's interesting because you talk about how, I mean, obviously EQ is, is really important here. And, and there's parts of this that, and, and you mentioned this in the book, that, that flies in the face of more, the more traditional, if that's the right word, rational analytical approach like getting to yes. And, and by the way, I, I'm a Harvard Business School alum, so I, I went through that negotiations program, the, the getting to yes, getting past no and all that. And, and in that, to, to oversimplify, you know, you're sort of taught to separate the person from the problem. In, in your premises, you, you can't do that. You, you can't separate the, the people from the problem because the, you know, the emotions are the problem and the emotions are wrapped up in the people. I just wanted you to elaborate on that. It's very interesting and, and so antithetical to, to that whole process and structure. Yeah, the real difference is just recognizing the reality of the intertwining of the emotions and the person and the prop. And emotions drive everything. And my Harvard brothers and sisters are becoming uh, much better at sort of recognizing that now. Certainly when there's less speculation and there's more neuroscience data to back it up. Because prior to neuroscience, a lot of this was just opinion. And from an academic and scientifically rigorous perspective, opinion is hard to quantify and test for and have rigor on. But yeah, the, the missing link is emotions. I ran across Roger Fisher uh, at Harvard when I went through there, one of the co-authors of Getting to Yes. Mm -hmm. And Roger Fisher's emotional intelligence was through the roof. Like this guy's insight to human nature and how people were wired was ridiculous. It's just based on the academic constraints of the time. They couldn't really, they didn't really know how to put it into a book. So they came up with this rational frame. <laughs> and so speaking of books, you know, your book, uh, you know, never split the difference, which refers to this notion that you, you shouldn't compromise at, at least in the sense of I'll meet you halfway, if you will. Um, that uh, that the long-standing belief that you should always look for these win-win outcomes is is a bunch of baloney. Why is that? What's uh, what's behind that? Well, uh, first, you know, it's kind of two parts that that, are, that helps to sort of unpack, as my Harvard brothers would love to say. <laughs> I'm not saying the word, but <laughs> I got you, brothers and sisters, if you will. So the idea of win-win, in point of fact, both sides should feel like they are better off. And the critical issue not is, are they better off, is do they feel better off? And how involved in a process is going to be critical to how much better off they think they feel. If, if you just dictated the best answer for me possible, if you just ordered me to do something, I wouldn't care that it was the best answer possible. I'd be angry that I wasn't involved. And I'd be extremely likely to reject your proposal, even if it left me better off because I didn't feel collaborative in, in a process. And win-win in terminology, it tends to be a phrase that if you and I are talking and you start out by saying like, look, I want to propose a win-win deal here. I know that your deal is you win, I lose. That you're looking out to win with me. And you, you, know, you got to listen carefully to what I say, win-win is a phrase that scares me when people use it right up front. And I'll post something like that on Instagram and 
People say, you saying we shouldn't have win-win deals? And my response is, well, if you were listening, you'd know that I didn't say that. But that's, you know, to actually be listening instead of being triggered by words and not paying attention to the con even a full sentence. So win-win is a phraseology. People who use it right off the bat use it to get people to drop their guard. Win-win hmm. is a mindset for some people makes them highly vulnerable. There are a lot of people whose attitude is if I make sure you you win, and since I believe in reciprocity, you do too. So you will in turn make sure I win, which is exactly what the sharks who use the term right off the bat are looking for. They're looking for the person who's ready to get their throat cut because they're waiting on the shark to reciprocate. So, it gets into a much more nuanced discussion of what is win-win actually and how do people count something as a win. That's the one thing that you brought up. And then the other thing is meeting somebody halfway. You're never going to feel like it was halfway. How can I say that? Danny Kahneman, Nobel Prize winner, behavioral economics, 2002 prospect theory, lost things twice as much as his equivalent gain. If there's a separation between us of $5 or $10, Separate distance between us is $10. Halfway is we each give in five. That's the rational answer. Unfortunately, humans, when you give five, you feel like you gave 10. Lost things twice as much as an equivalent gain. Mm -hmm. You don't see it as an even interaction. You feel it was unfair. And you're not going to feel good until you've gotten recouped by 10. Now, how does the person on the other side of that transaction feel? Well, you just bang them for 10. They're not going to feel okay till they get you for 20. And that's why this meeting in the middle is, is a downward spiral. It's just a guarantee of both sides to be unhappy. It's a guarantee of resentment. It's a guarantee of no appetite for long-term collaboration because you're always going to feel like you're losing. Yeah, no, it's fair. I mean, it, it halfway is sort of a state of mind, right? And and it changes based on where you're coming from. But it did get me thinking, you know, when, when you're in these hostage negotiations, the ideal outcome for you with the FBI is to have, you know, whatever they're asking for, a million dollars, they get zero, they turn the hostages over, and then they turn themselves in. No one's hurt, no money exchanges hands, Right. And the whole thing's, uh, you know, averted. There, there, there's no need for a long term relationship, you know, with the uh, uh, with the kidnapper. Right. Uh, or in, in bigger cases with the terrorists. But in, in daily life, which, of course, uh, you know, which is what you consult with at the Black Swan Group. It, if we do anything that's too one sided, that might be great for optimizing the outcome in the next five minutes. But uh, goodbye, long term relationship. So. Is that tough to sort of balance, you know, the short term needs with this long term relationship building exercise? Because assuming that it's a party that you're going to be working with for years and years and years, win win's probably the wrong word here for what we just talked about, but you, you need to find some way for both of you to walk away, if not feeling good, at least feeling the same amount of, of loss, if you will. Does that make sense? All right, so first of all, there's no such thing as a one-off negotiation under any circumstances, even in hostage negotiation. Hmm. Because we have repeat customers. And so if you don't see this guy again, somebody you worked with will. And so do you want to set up a colleague for failure? It was a guy, uh, Siege in Baltimore, Maryland, St. Patrick's Day, back in 2000, which I know sounds like a thousand years ago. Guy was on a run for four homicides. He'd been on a run for 10 days. He killed two people in the space of 24 hours. Largest manhunt in the history of Baltimore. They finally get him trapped in uh, the apartment of his girlfriend's mom. He's got girlfriend's mom, mom's boyfriend, and mom's boyfriend's 11-year-old son hostage. Negotiators are pretty rattled when they first talk to him on the phone. He literally says to him, you're not doing a good job with me. You're supposed to be establishing rapport. How does he say that? He'd been barricaded before. He'd been talked out before. If they'd have lied to him when they talked him out before, 
or treat it as a short term, do whatever you need to do to get him out. The next time he's barricaded, instead of saying, you're not doing a good job, you're supposed to be establishing rapport, he gets on the phone and said, you're a bunch of lying SOBs. And just to prove that I can't trust you, I got three people in here. I'm going to kill one of them right now. But he doesn't do that because the negotiators recognize they have to conduct themselves if they have repeat customers. Hmm. Home of Louisiana, same time frame. Guy takes hostages. They talk him out. He goes to jail. He takes hostages in jail. So every hostage negotiator has got to negotiate with a guy as if he, if I don't see him again, somebody I work with is. And if I go short term trickery for long term, because I don't got to see this guy again, I probably guarantee that somebody else is going to die. So there aren't any one offs among hostage negotiators who know what they're doing. Now, the flip side, in the private sector, People are treating every negotiation as if it's a one-off. Like, yeah, I can, I can screw these guys. I can call them names. I can do all this demonstration, you know, because it, and I, I don't know how people say this in their heads. You know, and simultaneously, you tell somebody that, that treats every negotiation as if it's a one-off. You say, all right, so if you do something right, three people know about it. If you do something wrong, 12 people know about it. Yeah, that's true. So how do you get away with screwing somebody over in a business deal and not think it's going to come back to haunt you? I get people in Los Angeles who are saying, yeah, Los Angeles is really Mayberry. It's a small town. Everybody knows everybody. So you say that, and yet you cheat people in deals. You lie to them. You flim flam them. You bamboozle them. Like it is a much bigger problem in a private sector. And how people figure they're not going to pay for it is just beyond me. Your group's called the Black Swan Group. Black Swan Group. Yes, sir. Talk to me about Black Swans, the, the unknown unknowns, as you put it. Yeah, well, you know, no matter how smart you are, Walter O'Brien, uh, I've run across Walter a couple of times, uh, put himself forward as having the highest IQ ever recorded. And it may be true. Like Walter may be one of the smartest dudes on earth, or he's in it, you know, he's, he's up there. He's way smarter than me. Even if you're Walter O'Brien, it's not possible to know everything going into a deal. Every human being and every negotiation, every, every company we coach, every entrepreneur we coach, we say, tell us a time you approached a negotiation where you weren't holding information back, whether it wasn't something about your timelines, your schedules, your supply chain, your boss's demands, your employee's demands, your wife's demands, that were impacting negotiation that you weren't holding back your budget, your prospects, where your thoughts are the economy. And they'll be like, well, yeah, of course. There's always stuff. Well, if you are, the so is the other side. So if you're both holding stuff back and you're holding it back because it would impact the negotiations in a very big way, it's not possible for you to know what the best outcome is. You know, as Daniel Pink would say, we're living in a world of imperfect information. So there's always going to be black swans. Because not only you don't know what they're hiding from you, but you don't know what your hidden information, how it interacts with their hidden information. There's this overlap that nobody really knows what's going to happen unless we open up a little bit. So there's always going to be unknowns. Even if you're Walter O'Brien, smart, smartest guy on earth, there's a, something to be discovered in the negotiation process itself which will lead to a better outcome if you take the time to find out what it is. Hmm. Then you have the podcast is called the art of excellence. Yeah. I, I love for my guest to define that word excellence. So what does it mean to you? Excellence is a delight with learning and growing. It is not the pursuit of perfection. The pursuit of perfection is a fool's errand. I guarantee that you will always be unsatisfied or if you achieve it, that you've learned nothing. I mean, it's looking at Patrick Mahomes as an NFL quarterback who delights in learning about the game and thinking up new stuff. And he is in the pursuit of excellence because he's in love with what he does for a living and he can't learn enough about it. If Patrick Mahomes had a game where he 
completed every pass, he'd look at the game field and like, oh, I could have done that better. Here's a better way to have done that. You know, so the uh, the pursuit of excellence is really the pursuit of delight and learning simultaneously, I think. Yeah, it was the chasing perfection and, and coming to the realization that it's a fool's errand. Was that firsthand experience earlier in your life or just, just from having intuition on what's really important? I never really did. Maybe I wondered if I should until I started hearing smart people say, I think my, I heard Mark Cuban say perfection is the enemy of profitability. Hmm. Then I started hearing people I respect really begin to put perfection in context for me and go like, ah, I, I admire who that person is and here's their take on it. And I want to be where they are. I would trade places with Mark Cuban. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You and me both. Uh, what else is on your mind? What else uh, do we need to share here? Well, we've got a new method of group coaching, if you will. Mm -hmm. It's a subscription service. It's on a, it's on an app called Fireside, which is available on whatever phone you have, Fireside. Mm -hmm. And we originally, it was sold to us as, pitched to us as an interactive podcast. You know, interactive live podcast where the people that are listening come on live and get asked questions after we talk about whatever we want to talk about. And I thought, that sounds really interesting. And we implemented it and we found out that it's, in point of fact, it's group coaching. And in a price tag that we, we put on it, like if, if you bought group coaching from us, we would charge you $5,000 an hour, an hour. The subscription fee for this is $84 a month. And we got people signing in from all over the world. I got all, all the members of my team. It's a once uh, an hour session once a week. And I'm on once a month and we tee up a topic and then people get asked questions about either the topic or a negotiation that they have that they need help on right now. And what is an, was pitched as an interactive podcast in point of fact, turns out to be group coaching for people that are on the entrepreneurial journey. Like if you were on the journey of getting to become a better negotiator, this is going to be your weekly interaction that you're going to need to stay sharp, stay sharp. Weekly live interaction. Okay. Wow. I like it. I will point to it in the show notes. I, I know you got to hop. This is, I, I have a thousand other questions I could ask, and maybe we'll have a part two at some point. I'd love that. I, I know how precious your time is. Um, thank you for, for doing this. And I uh, hope we can meet again at some time. Yeah, I look forward to it, man. Thank you for having me on. Thank you, Chris. All right, take care. Hey everyone, okay, please don't go away just yet. A couple favors to ask. Favor number one, and I know I've asked before, but if you haven't had a chance to leave a review and you enjoy the show, it would honestly mean a lot if you could go to iTunes and write a review. That goes a long way, so thank you for that. Also, I had a chance to deliver a keynote based on a lot of the learnings I've had from this show. Really enjoyed it. So if you are in any way affiliated with any organization, for-profit, non-for-profit, doesn't really matter, but there's some event where you think they might be looking for a keynote, I appreciate if you would keep me in mind for that. I can be reached at glenn at theartofexcellence.com. Thank you all for listening. We are inching closer to episode 100. Super excited for that sometime later this year. In the meantime, keep being excellent. Tune in next time. Thanks, everybody.